Now, if you have your Bibles, first the third chapter of John's Gospel, then we'll go to Hebrews, the twelfth chapter. Now, we'll read some scripture over there in First Peter and Second Peter, but you'll not be very far away there in Hebrews 12. So just find those two openings, John's Gospel, the third chapter, and Hebrews chapter 12. John's Gospel, the third chapter. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. I want you to notice that verse particularly, that sixth verse. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered, and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knoweth not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Wanted you to notice particularly the sixth verse, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now turning to the book of Hebrews, the twelfth chapter, I want you to notice two verses. And that's the ninth verse, and then particularly the twenty-third verse. However, we'll read several verses here. The ninth verse. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh. He was talking about earlier in the other verse, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. We have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? I wanted you to notice the expression, Father of Spirits. Now then, we'll start with the 18th verse again, here in this 12th chapter, to get full what he's saying. These are Hebrew Christians that he's writing to, remember. For ye are not come unto the mount, talking about Mount Sinai, that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned, or thrust through with the dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come, see, not unto Mount Sinai, but ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, I want you to notice again, unto the spirits of just men made perfect. 
Don't let that word perfect true you. It just simply means mature. Just men, the spirits made mature, grown. Praise God. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And then I want you to notice in 1 Peter. 1 Peter, the first chapter and the 23rd verse. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. I'm going to read that again. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Then in 2 Peter, I want you to notice, well, we'll just read the first through the fourth verse. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. How is grace and peace multiplied unto us? Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us, oh, I like this, all things, He's not going to give them to us, he has. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Don't you like that? According as his divine power is going to give to us when we get to heaven. No, no. Already done it. Hath given. Hath given. We would say in modern uses, has given unto us all things, all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Now, how are they given unto us? Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us according as the divine power has given unto us whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We are talking in this series of lessons first about developing the human spirit. You'll notice that one of the texts said here, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life, he there is not talking about natural human life. He's talking about eternal life, the God kind of life that we receive. Notice that he talks about given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of God. I'll repeat some things I said and then I'll add to it. I'm sure of this one thing that the knowledge of the effect of the life of God and of eternal life on man's spirit is yet in its infancy. We have never really realized yet. You see, man, God created him in his own image. God is a spirit, Jesus said. And God, who is a spirit, created man in the image and in the likeness of God. 
So man is in the same class of being with God. It'll help you in your thinking if you think like this. Don't put the body first. Don't put the mind first. Think from the spiritual standpoint. You are a spirit being. You do have a soul and you live in a body, but you are a spirit being because you're created in the likeness and image of God and God is a spirit. Then you must of necessity be a spirit. But you see, if you're more mind conscious, then you develop your mind all right. Sometimes your body and your spirit are neglected. Or if you're more body conscious, you may develop your body, but sometimes the mind and the spirit are not developed. If you're only mind and body conscious, you may develop your mind, you may develop your body, but the spirit's not developed. We should put the spirit of man before the body and before the mind and develop the spirit. You see, when man fell, when Adam fell in the garden, his spirit became estranged, separated from God. And you'll notice and find that in individuals. Paul said there in Romans 7, 9, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now you see, you'll notice that he said he is the father of spirits. And that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit, spirit. And of course our bodies, we partake of our nature of our earthly parents when we were born. But where did our spirits come from? Well, they came from God. And what Paul was saying there in Romans 7, 9, I was alive. He's talking about his spirit was alive unto God before he got old enough to know right from wrong and reach the age of accountability. And when the commandment came, sin revived, the sin nature that was in his flesh, not in his spirit, revived, and he died. That is, his spirit was estranged from God. His spirit was separated from God. I made mention of the fact that I remember as a little boy, my spirit was, was alive unto God. And I would say, I'm going to be a preacher. And I'd get out as a little fella, just four years old, and preach to the cabbage heads. And five years old, and preach to the beanstalks. Then I got up about nine years old. The commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And from about nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, my spirit was no longer, even though I went to church, my spirit was no longer alive unto God. It was estranged from God. I'm gonna be a lawyer. But you see, the moment that my spirit was reborn and my spirit had come back into fellowship with God, that very night that I was born again, I said to the Lord, all right, Lord, you get me up from here because I was bedfast and I'll go preach. Praise God. And he got me up and I went to preach. And I've been at it ever since then for 45 years plus. Hallelujah to Jesus. Now, you know that heart hunger really is in the heart of every man, really. Even the unsaved. That heart hunger can never be satisfied with the world. It drives people to do a lot of things. They're seeking satisfaction. But that heart, that spirit hunger that's on the inside of every man is perhaps the most outstanding feature of man and it can never be satisfied until he finds God, until his spirit is back into fellowship with the Father God. We know that uh, you and I have been born again. We read here, being born again. I like that, as Peter said here, not of corruptible seed but incorruptible, even the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. But now then after we're born again, we need to develop our spirits. We need to grow spiritually. We need to grow up spiritually. And that's what he's talking about when he said the spirits of just men made perfect. And uh, actually that word and some translations read that way, the spirit of just men made mature. Now then over in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, you will find that uh, the Bible tells us that when Jesus ascended on high, for instance, the fourth chapter, the 11th verse, when he ascended on high, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for what purpose did he give them? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. 
till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ. May grow up. He wants us to grow. He wants us to develop. This is spiritual growth. This is spiritual development. And twice in the scriptures, these ministries, gifts have been given for the perfecting of the saints. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Some translation reads unto a mature man. In other words, what he's talking about is a grown up person spiritually, just like a person may become grown up physically. Well, can our spirits grow up. Can our spirits be developed? Thank God they can. We learn, we know this, how to develop the human body, cultivate it. We know how to cultivate and develop the intellect until people have become mental gymnasts. We've developed the human body until people have become physical athletes. But too many times there's no one to teach us, even in the church, it's too much soul developed and intellectual developed, not enough spiritual development. And no one has taught us to develop our spirits. Well, you see, first of all, realize this in spiritual development that your spirit is the real you. Begin with that. Your spirit is the real you. Your body's not the real you. The outward man, there is an inward man. The Bible speaks of an outward man and an inward man. Paul talks about, I'm going to depart. Talking about physically dying. I'm going to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Now who's going to depart? He is. Not his body, but he is. Paul said again, I keep under my body. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. I keep under my body. Who does? I do. I bring it. Now, see, if your body was really you, he'd have said, I keep myself under, I bring myself into subjection. He didn't say that in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. He said, I keep my body under. I bring it into subjection. Calling his body, it, bringing it into subjection to what? To his spirit. Lest by any means, after I preach to others, I myself should be disapproved, a castaway or disapproved. Now, what's Paul saying? He's saying that the spirit is the real you. And that spirit man goes on living when the physical body is dead. Brother Vep Ellis Sr. was here and Brother DeWeese. Brother DeWeese gave his testimony, had a heart attack and died. And uh, when he left his body, he said he was going up through this valley and he saw the, the city and he started running to get there. And about that time, he heard somebody hollering, Mr. Deweese, Mr. Deweese, Mr. Deweese. See, doctors have learned. And they can prove by scientific facts that there's life after death now. And so he opened his eyes and, you know, they'd got massaged his heart and got it to beating again. It didn't beat for a minute or two or three. And the, the doctor was calling him back. And he said to the doctor, why in the world did you call me back for? He didn't want to come back. He was running to get to the city. I read in the newspaper and then the doctor contacted me, the doctor, a cardiologist over in Chattanooga, Tennessee. They were performing a, some kind of a heart operation and this young man died. They began to massage his heart and get, finally got it to going again. And this doctor I read in the newspaper and then have since heard him on television, then he contacted me wanting to put my experience in his book and he did and he wrote a book on it. And this medical doctor, cardiologist said, this young man, now I'd had some experience before, but had let it get by me, but said this young man 
began to scream. He was in panic. He said, oh my God, doctor, don't let me go. Don't let me go. I went to hell. I'm going to hell. Don't let me go. Oh, keep me here. Don't let me go. I went to hell. He said, you're just in panic. You know? And then, and, and he thought he was going again, you know. And the way this doctor told the newspaper reporter at that time, because he hadn't gotten saved then himself, he was a church member and thought he was, he said, that scared the fool out of me. <laughs> he said, that scared the fool out of me. That fellow was in panic. He said, don't let me go. My God, I went to hell. Oh my God, don't let me go. Don't let me go. Don't let me go. And then he began to say to him, doctor, pray. You know how to pray? Pray with me. And he said, I hadn't been to church in a long time. We used to say prayers. And finally he said, I got up enough nerve to say some kind of a prayer with him. And we got the fellow stabilized and kept him. And he said, I went home. That just scared the fool out of me. <laughs> And I went home and dusted my Bible off. I had one. And I began to read it. And the more I read it, that doctor said, I said, it's right there in the Bible. That's what the Bible said all the time. And he said, you see, we've proven. He goes on to give case experience after case experience of bringing people back. He said, I noticed the Christians are always at peace. They go into a peaceful valley. They see a city. They don't want to come back. The others are screaming and crying that we brought back. I know exactly what they're talking about. I've been interested in that injured man because see on the 22nd day of April, 1933, in the south bedroom of 405 North College Street in the city of McKinney, Texas, just as grandpa's old clock on the mantel struck 7.30, my heart stopped. And I leaped out of my body like a man would leap off of a diving board into the swimming pool. And I began to descend down, 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 until the lights of the earth, I could see them like he was going down in a well or in a cavern. The lights of the earth finally faded away above me and the darkness encompassed me around about. Darkness is darker than any night that man's ever seen. Darkness is so dense it seemed if you'd had your hand right up here within an inch of your face, you couldn't see it. Darkness is so dense it seemed if you'd had a knife, you could cut a chunk of it out. And as I went down through the darkness, the further down I went, the darker it became. The darker it became. Until finally, way down beneath me, I could see fingers of light flickering on the wall of darkness. And in a few moments, I came to the bottom of the pit. And I saw out in front of me the gates of hell. And then I saw beyond the entrance of hell a great giant orange orb of flame with a white crest. And it pulled me, an irresistible pull. I knew I was out of my body, yet I knew everything just like I was in my body. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, you remember the 12th chapter of 2 Corinthians, Paul said, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. You see, Paul, all Bible scholars agree that he's talking about his own experience. And I knew such a man, whether in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, such as one caught up into the third heaven or into paradise. And he heard unspeakable words or words which is not lawful for him to utter. He couldn't tell it. But he couldn't tell whether he's in the body. Now, now as far as you're concerned, when you die, as far as you're concerned, you can't tell whether you're in the body or out of the body. Are you listening to me now? I'm saying this to you to prove from the Bible that the real man, your spirit, is the real you. And being spirit, it's eternal. Spirits never die. Spirits are eternal. Whether they're good spirits or bad spirits, they're eternal. The only difference is they'll live one place or the other. Receiving eternal life means receiving the life and the nature of God into my spirit that changes my spirit and makes me a new man in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah to God. When I got to the bottom of that pit and the fires of hell beat in my face, there was a creature of some kind that met me to escort me in through the portals. The gates of hell were open. And uh, I intended to put up a fight if I could to keep them going in. I did slow down my descent. Never did stop, but I did slow down my descent. When I did, that creature was at my right hand. He took me by my right arm to escort me in. 
Well, first of all, I didn't know and didn't know it for many years afterwards. The Bible said, hell from beneath, Isaiah said, hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee. Hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee. Well, that creature met me. He's some kind of a spirit being, I don't know. I never did look at him. I never did look at that creature. I couldn't. My eyes were riveted to the fires of hell. And when I endeavored to stop, he took me by the arm to escort me in. When he did, there was a voice that spoke way above the darkness. I don't know what he said. It was a male voice or a man voice. I believe it was God or Jesus. I don't know what he said because it was not in, in the English language. It was a foreign tongue, an alien tongue to me. I don't know how many words he spoke because sometimes in foreign language, you know, but I'd say he spoke anywhere from six to eight, maybe 12 words. And when those words were spoken, that place shook like there's an earthquake on. And that voice echoed through the cavern of the dam. And that creature took his hand off of my arm. And there was an irresistible pull like a suction to my back. I didn't turn around. I just floated backwards. Didn't walk, floated. Until I got back in the darkness, away from the portals, the entrance, the gates of hell. I got back into the darkness and then I was pulled like a magnet or pull of metal. I was pulled. I came up, up through the darkness. Before I got to the top out of the thing, I could see the lights of the earth above me like it was coming up out of a well or out of a deep cave. And I came up on the porch outside my bedroom and I went right through the wall and I went right into my body like a man would slip his foot inside of his boot in the morning time. And when I got back inside my body, before I ever really got back inside my body, I saw my body lying there on the bed. I saw my grandmother holding me in her arms, holding my head and bathing my face with a cool cloth. And I just seemed to leap inside my body. When I got back inside my body, then I could contact her. Now, this doctor from Chattanooga said many times these folks that have died on the operating table and that we brought back said they were up there about the ceiling. They could see what we were doing. They could see everything that we did. They heard us calling them back. That's the reason they learned. That's the reason this doctor did that. They have seminars on. They learn to call their spirits back. Mr. Deweese, the doctor said, Mr. Deweese, come on back. And <laughs> he came on back. They're beginning to learn a little bit themselves about spiritual things. So when I got back inside my body, then I could talk to my grandmother through this voice. And I don't know how I knew it. Your spirit just knows things your head don't know. And I said, I'm going again. I don't know how I knew I was going again. And I thought I wouldn't be back. I said, I want to tell mama goodbye. She said, son, I told your mother that you was dead. You're gone. And she ran outside screaming and praying. And about that time I heard her, she came back around. We had an old house, you know, and had a porch nearly all the way around the house. And she came back around on the south side, you could hear her praying at the top of her voice. And so my mother, my grandmother called her name two or three times trying to get her. And she said, I'll go get her. She started to get up and I said, no, 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 don't leave me. Somewhere or another you want somebody with you. Don't leave me. I don't want to be by myself. Stay with me. I said, you just tell mama I said goodbye. You tell mama I said I love her. You tell mama that, you, that I said I appreciate her staying with us and when my daddy forsook us and trying to make a living for us until she broke her health down. And I said, tell mama that I love her. And tell mama that I said if I've ever put a gray hair in her head or a wrinkle in her face that I'm sorry. Tell mama I said goodbye. Then I said to my grandmother, you've been a second mother to me when mama's health failed. And I want you to know I appreciate it and I love you. And my grandmother would always say, 
kissed me right there, kissed me right there. And I kissed her on her cheek and said goodbye. And my heart stopped. And I leaped out of my body. And I began to descend down, 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 down. It seemed an eternity. I, I drifted down until the lights of the earth above me faded away and the darkness encompassed me around about. And I had identically the same experience I had the first time. And that creature took me by the arm to escort me in. And the voice said, whatever it said, I don't know what it said. But he took his hand off of me and I was pulled back away from the entrance to hell and came back up. Only the difference was this time, instead of coming up on the porch, I came up at the foot of the bed. I saw my body lying there in death. I saw my grandmother holding my head in her arms. I leaped from the foot of the bed inside my body through my mouth. I got back inside my body like you'd put your coat on, you see, and then I could function in that realm. And I said, Granny, I don't know how I knew it. In the world, you know, we'd say the third time's a charm. And I said, I'm going again. I don't know how I knew I was going again. My spirit knew it. I'm going again, and this is the third time I won't be back. She said, son, I didn't think you was coming back that time. <laughs> I said, Granny, where's Grandpa? I want to tell him goodbye. She said, son, you know your granddad went out in the east part of town to collect rent from some of his rent houses. Oh, I said, I remember that. I'd just forgotten it. Well, I said, tell Grandpa I said goodbye and tell him I love him. I never had a daddy. It's the closest thing to a daddy I had. But tell him I appreciate, appreciate him giving me a home when I had none. Then I left a word for my oldest brother, Dub, and for my sister, who's the oldest child, and for my youngest brother, who's nine years of age. And my heart stopped, and I leaped outside my body. And I began to descend down, 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 down down, 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 until the lights of the earth faded away above me. The darkness encompassed me around about. And in the darkness, I cried out, God, I belong to the church. I've been baptized in water. Now listen for an answer. And all I could hear was my own voice as it echoed through the darkness. So I cried a little louder, God, I belong to the church. I've been baptized in water. All the time I'm going down, down. I listened. There was no answer. Only the voice, the echo of my own voice as it echoed through the cavern of the damned. The third time I literally screamed, God, God. I'm trying to tell him I'm not to be going this direction. <laughs> I've been baptized in water. I belong to the church. There was only silence. I came to the bottom of the pit. I came to the entrance to hell. That creature took me by the arm to escort me in. That voice spoke from heaven. He took his hand off my arm. I was pulled back into the darkness. And then up, and as I started my ascent, I began to pray. My spirit, the man on the inside. I said that to you to say this to you. The spirit is the real man. The spirit is the real man. I was a sinner then. I had become estranged from God. I knew him when I was a little kid. You see, I was alive without the law, alive under God once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. My spirit, you see, Spiritual death is separation from God. My spirit became separated from God. And so I began my prayer, the inward man, the inward man, the real man's spirit. And I began my prayer there in the darkness. And then when I came up, I came up by the side of the bed. The only difference was I came up on the porch the first time, the foot of the bed the second time, beside the bed the third time. And I leaped inside my body and my lips vocally picked up the prayer where I was right in the middle of a sentence. And I prayed out loud. And I prayed so loud they tell me they could hear me for two blocks around. Somebody said, I hear preachers saying sometimes, you know, that people ought to, you know, be saved just to miss hell. They ought to go there and they'd think so. I know. I was like that young man that doctor bought back. I was panicking in panic. No, sir, I'd thank God every night I didn't go to hell. I thought I had to die, but I'd go to sleep afterwards every single night thanking God that I didn't go to hell. Praise God forevermore. Amen. There is a hell to shun. 
and there is a heaven to gain. And so I, my voice picked up that prayer right in the middle of a sentence. I just asked God in the name of Jesus to forgive me of every sin and cleanse me of all that's wrong. Hallelujah. And I'll tell you, it felt to me like there's a two-ton weight lifted from off of my chest. The burden of sin was gone. I became a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I looked at Grandpa's old clock, and it's 20 minutes till 8 o'clock. I went to hell three times between 7.30 and 20 minutes to 8 o'clock, and I was born again at 20 minutes till 8 o'clock. Hallelujah. Amen. The inward man, the inward man is the real you. That's what I want to get over. The spirit is the real you. God is the father of spirits. God deals with spirits. Are you listening to me? Now, I was bedfast. The doctor said I had to die. To tell you the real truth about it, that night, see, they thought I was had gone like my grandma said. I thought you weren't coming back. My grandmother said, son, you know, I've had a lot of experience. See, my great-grandfather was a doctor, Dr. A.M. Drake. And she had practiced with him. Till I remember as a little boy, because we didn't have as many doctors as we do now. A lot of times in the nighttime, people would come to get granny, you see, because she knew a lot about whatever the doctors knew of that day of medical. And she said, I had a lot of experience waiting on the sick. I had a lot of experience in the early days here in the state of Texas when we just had to prepare people as best we could for burial, preparing people for burial that had died. But she said, I learned more about death with you than I knew in India. And so then, in the summer of 1933, there was a three-week period that I was unconscious. And then two periods of two weeks that I was unconscious. And when I came to myself, I asked them what time it is. I thought it had been 10 minutes, and they told me what day it was. But now listen to me. And this can help and it can encourage in many areas. I know because I've been there. When I was unconscious, and I thought, like I said, when I came to myself, it had been 10 minutes. My body didn't function. My mind, from the standpoint of this world, I didn't talk to anybody in this world I couldn't see. I was in a coma. I was unconscious from the physical standpoint. But my spirit, all that time, talked with God. My spirit was in contact with him. Doctors are learning now, and they'll tell you, because I'd also pick up in my spirit what people said around my bed. Doctors will tell you now. I've talked to some of them. They've learned, and they'll tell you, if somebody is, is terminal or to die, because many of them come through, don't talk that around them, even though they're unconscious, because their spirits will pick that up. Amen. People ought to be careful what they say around sick people, people that are even unconscious. My spirit was in contact with God. My spirit. Because really, your spirit's the real you. Talk with God while I was unconscious. I'm saying this to you. That's the way the Lord wants us to go, so that's the way we're going, and I'm not done yet. <laughs> On the 16th day of August, 1933, and I'd been saved, born again, since the 22nd day of April in 1933. 16th day of August, 1933 was on a Thursday. Did you know that? Well, if you didn't, you know it now. I just got through telling you. All that day, I knew I was dying. See, I'd been dead. I knew I'm dying. It got to be 106 degrees. It can get 106 easily sometimes down Texas. I was farther south than here, and even here, over 100 easy in August. 106 degrees. We had no air conditioning in 1933. If you had anything at all, just a fan to blow a little air around. We just had the windows and the doors open, whatever air could circulate. It's got to be 106 degrees. It's over 100 by noontime. Yet my body is so cold that they got me wrapped in blankets. My body is so cold that they got all of the hot water bottles. They, they heat bricks and wrap them up in newspaper and in blankets, and I'm encased with all these blankets and hot bricks and, and try, trying to warm me up because my body is cold as ice. And at 1.30 in the afternoon, as my young brother, nine years old, stood there by my bed, death fastened his final throes upon me. And I said to Pat, run and get Mama quick. I'm dying. I want to tell her goodbye. And he ran out of the room like a shot. When he left the room, the whole room lit up, brighter than sun shining on snow. You know how it glistens when sun shines on snow? That whole room lit up. That whole room was filled with a cloud that was bright and shining. And I left my body and went up into that cloud. Got just a little peek. 
over into the glory world. Now, I thought that that was only a few seconds because the next thing I remember was that that glory cloud began to lift out of my room and I could see up there about where the top of the house, not the ceiling, the top of the house should be. And I looked back down in the room. That's what the doctor said. Said these people many times that had died, said we were up there looking down on you. See, we, we saw you. They worked on their body to bring them back. And I saw my body lying there. And I saw my mother as she came. And I saw her as she held my hand in hers. And I came down and came inside my body. When I got back inside my body, then I could talk to mama. And I said, mama, I'm not going to die now. She thought, I meant I'm not going to die now this minute. I meant, I'm not going to die now. I'm going to live and do the work of God. Because see up there in that glory, I heard a voice speak. This time in the English language. I believe it was Jesus. I didn't see him, just heard the voice. It's a man's voice. said, go back, go back, go back to the earth. You can't come yet. Your work on earth is not done. And I descended. Now, in preaching on the radio, to me that experience was too sacred. I didn't even talk about going to hell. That's too terrible. I didn't, until God told me to, I didn't talk about this other experience. It, it was so sacred. It was so sacred. For many, many years, many, many years, I suppose 10 or 12, 15 years, I never mentioned it to a living soul. I'd think about it sometime. And then God told me to go to telling it. So I started telling it. Well, in recent time, I was preaching on the radio before my mother died, and I was talking about the inward man, eternal man, and the real you. Your spirit's the real you. And so I gave that experience, the Bible, and then experience. And then I saw Mama, and Mama said, Son, I, I didn't know that. Because, see, I'd never told her until I heard you on the radio tell that. But she said, The way you tell it, you were only gone maybe a few seconds. Well, you talked maybe 10 seconds at the most. I said, yeah, that's what I thought. Well, she said, you never did hear my side and mama, my grandmother's side of the story. Let me tell you this, Pat come running back to the kitchen, hollering, mama, mama, granny, granny, Ken's a dying, Ken's a dying. And she said, I was closer to the kitchen door and I ran up the hall into the dining room to come into your bedroom and I couldn't enter it. The bedroom's full of something. That's what I saw. I, I can't go in. I recognized the presence of God and back, back against the dining room table and bowed my head to pray. Granny, her mother came behind her. The door's open. The door shutter's open. She run right up against that open opening and bounced back like you'd hit a rubber ball. And say, she said, as she looked then, see, she didn't look. She said, why, well, Lily, the room, I can't see the bed. I can't see Ken. I can't see his body. The room is full of a cloud. Like a thick fog, it's white and glistening. And I can't see the dresser and I can't see the bed. I can't see anything. The room's full of that. That's the glory of God. <laughs> and she said, Granny, back to back, about halfway of the dining room made another run and hit that opening and bounced off of it. She, the third time, backed all the way across the room and ran across the dining room and hit the open door and, and bounced off. And she seemed to be so overcome, Mama said, with the presence of God that she hung on to the door facing. She said it was 10 minutes. You talk like it's 10 seconds. It was 10 minutes before we could get into the room. It was 10 minutes. We couldn't enter in until the cloud disappeared. And as soon as it disappeared, I rushed up to the bed and took your hand and you were dead. And about that time you said, Mama, I'm not going to die now. I said that to say this to you. The real man, your spirit is the real you. That's the part of you that contacts God. That's the part of you that's recreated and made a new creature in Christ Jesus and receives eternal life. That's the part of you that should dominate you. That man on the inside should dominate you. Not your body, not your mind. The spirit should dominate you. That's one thing that I'm striven through the years to do, to let my spirit dominate me. 
that spirit, that's the part of you that gives personality or gives color to you. Another interesting story along this line that you'd be interested in, we're talking about spiritual things, and your spirit's the real you. I think, well, I know this something. There's Brother Charlie Hazen back there. We started out, you know, we first moved to Tulsa, we bought that old building on North Utica. And uh, we, we built a little chapel in there to seat about 300. And we'd have seminars every so often. We've grown, you see, now up to a chapel of 3,000. And so uh, one time, there in a seminar, Sister Wilkerson, and God used her in prophecy. She's really a prophetess. But she's not the least bit pushy. In fact, she'd never say anything. When I first came to Tulsa, in 1963, she came into my meetings. I didn't know who she was. But I closed the meeting. I said, this lady right over there, whoever you got something, get up and give it out. I knew it in the spirit. She got up and began to prophesy. And it just make the hair stand on the back of your neck. And so she had something she'd never speak unless I'd tell her. You see, God's not going to hide from the leader of the meeting if he's sensitive what he's going to do in the meeting. Are you listening to me? Amen. And I'd say, go ahead. I knew she had it. I know sometimes folks, they might think, well, they had that framed up. No, we didn't have it framed up. So I said, Sister Wilkerson, go ahead and obey God. <laughs> Just go ahead and obey God. And so she got up and began to prophesy. Now she prophesied a number of things, but she prophesied concerning me that I would have an experience like Enoch. Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. That I would be caught up to heaven and would receive certain revelation and that they would be another with me in on it as a witness and so on. Well, I don't try to make something come to pass if it prophesied. If it comes to pass, fine. Glory to God. If it doesn't, well, that's all right. But if it's right, just wait on God and it'll come to pass. Don't worry about it. Don't bother about it. Don't try to push it. So in the process of time, my sister, the only sister I had with the oldest child of the family, died. And she died at age 55 with cancer. Now, uh, she didn't have to, but she did. God began to tell me two years ahead of time she's going to die. And over there in that old building on North Utica, we had an apartment there. And I'd come in between meetings and night after night. My wife was used to me being up praying all the time during the night used to more to do today and she never thought anything about it. Me being out of bed if she did wake up and I prayed and laid on my face and trying to get God to change that. He said, no, don't, don't ask me. She's going to die. Don't ask me. See, I have to tell my folks the same thing to tell you the truth. He said, you see, five years ago you prayed her out of death. Jesus himself appeared to me in a vision and told me what would happen. She had one type of cancer then that was healed of. This is a different thing. The doctor said no relation between the two whatsoever. And the Lord told me then when he appeared to me to give her five more years because I asked him to. And he said, you see, she's had five years, saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, member of a full gospel church, taught a Sunday school class, full gospel church. But she, he said, you see, she didn't try to build her own faith. She hadn't done one thing about it. She hadn't listened one time to one of your radio programs you're on every day. She hadn't read one single of your books. She could have all of them. She hadn't listened to one single of your tapes. She didn't endeavor to build up her faith. Like Smith Wigglesworth said, if you wait till you need faith to get it, you're too late. So don't even ask me. Well, I have to preach the truth, you see, whether it's my kinfolk or whoever it is. See? Well, we were all around the bedside when she passed away. Then we came back, uh, we still had a little house there in Garland, a little frame house, and my wife and I came back out there after we'd gone back to my sister's house, and it's past midnight. My wife's getting ready, you know, it takes women longer to get ready for bed. It takes them longer in the morning to get ready, you know. They got more to put on than we do. Of course, they look prettier than the rest of us. You'll have to admit that. She's in the bathroom cleansing her face and getting ready and whatever women do for an hour, an hour and a half. You know. <laughs> no, not that long, but it seems like it sometimes, don't it? Any of you men know what I'm talking about? Well, the rest of you ain't married. You'll find out one of these days. So, I lay down on the bed. Now, of course, at a time like that, you're emotionally, the only sister you had is gone. You feel a great loss. And I lay down there on the bed. I'm lying there wide awake because, you know, you're emotionally all. And I got to thinking about it, really. I got to thinking about when I 
left my body and went up into that glory. She's saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. And I got to thinking about it. In fact, actually, when she left, I looked up. Because I knew she went up. Sometimes God may give you a glimpse. He may not. Sometimes I have seen into the other world. So I knew that she went up. I knew that she looked back down on us like I did and saw us around that bed. Would have liked to have spoken to us if she could. And I was thinking that, wide awake now, lying there on the bed, and I was thinking that, when suddenly, wide awake with my eyes wide open, thinking about, see the picture of us around that bed and her look back down on us. When suddenly, I just went up. Just like he was traveling up through the air. It was my inward man, my spirit. I went up. I had the experience that, that Sister Wilkerson had prophesied about months before. I went up. And I got up to heaven. Seemed like I was just traveling through the air, you know, at a high rate of speed. And I got up to heaven. And I saw my sister and Jesus talking. And I walked up behind her, you see, and Jesus was facing her. They were facing each other. And I walked up behind her, and he looked at me. And just like if two of you were talking, somebody walked up behind the person you're looking at, looked at you, well, you'd look around and see who it was. I don't know what he said. He was talking to her. I heard the sound of his voice, but didn't detect the words. As I walked up, you see, I wasn't that close. And, and, and he was looking at me, and when he looked, she knew somebody walked, so she looked around. When she looked around, she turned around and said to me, Ken, don't feel so badly that you couldn't pray the prayer of faith for me. Might I tried. I'm a winner. I'm not a loser. Amen. I'll turn hell and earth upside down. Amen. Don't, and I did. I did. I, I felt badly. I'd always got answers from a kinfolks. I'd prayed more than one of them out of death. but I couldn't do it this time. Don't feel so badly, she said, that you couldn't pray the prayer of faith for me. There was a reason why. She didn't tell me. There was a reason why. But she said, uh, I suffered a lot, but now that it's all over, I wouldn't go back to the earth if I could. I wouldn't come back if I could. If I was given the opportunity, I, I, I'd say, no, I'm not going back. I wouldn't go back. Ben I'm here. I want to stay here. And then she said, I've already seen Grandpa and Granny. She said, the first thing Grandpa said was, how's Lily? That's my mother. She said, I, I told him. He said, well, it won't be long till she'll be up here with us. And it wasn't. And then he said, I've seen Ann. Anne was her daughter, 25 years old, and died as a result of an automobile accident. Said the first thing Anne said is, how's Bill? That was her husband. She said, I didn't tell Anne that Bill had remarried. <laughs> now here's the revelation I want you to get. It blessed me, and that's what Miss Wilkerson was testifying, was prophesying about. Here's the revelation. She said, you see, people up here are not interested in the natural life. They don't care how much money you got in the bank or if you bought a new car, a new suit of clothes. They're interested in the spiritual life, in the spirit. And they know what's going on in your life spiritually. Did you get it? That's a revelation I got. They know if you're making spiritual progress or not. I remembered after that. I remembered what Paul said. Here in the 12th chapter, go back again over there to Hebrews with me real quick. Notice something here. Wherefore, first verse of the 12th chapter of Hebrews, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does easily beset us, and let us run with patience the rates that set before us. Verse 4, seeing we're also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. 
If you'll go back and study the Greek on that in different translations, what he's talking about here, what Paul's talking about is, you see, like a, that fellow running the race out there and there are people back up here in the grandstand that's watching you. He's talking about these people that's already run their race, made it on the other side, and they're watching us as we run our race. Hallelujah to Jesus, looking over the banisters of heaven. If you've got any loved ones that's over there, they're watching you. Bless God, they're pulling for you to win that race. She said, they're not interested in the natural, but they know about the spiritual. I remembered later as I thought about it, the Bible said that the angels in heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. Heaven knows then when people repent, don't they? Amen. Don't they? Amen. Don't they? Amen. Hallelujah to Jesus. And then she said, Ken, you couldn't pray the prayer of faith for me. There was a reason why, but you can help Joyce. That was one of her daughters. Oh, I don't know, maybe 30 years old. I don't know how old she was, 28, 30. She'd had 30 shock treatments. She walked around like a robot. There at the hospital, my wife and old Reese would have to say, Joy, put your hands down. Before you know it, they're back up. You couldn't help me, but you can help her. And then the line there on the bed. I saw the Sunday night service down at the First Assembly of God Church in Garland, Texas, where Brother Wood was pastor. I saw all of us there. I saw myself standing on the platform and minister by laying our hands to joy. So I'll finish that part of it. We buried my sister, died Thursday night, buried her on Saturday. Then on Sunday we was all there at church, her home church. And Brother Wood said, well, I would ask Brother Hagin to preach, but of course I realized, you know, so I didn't say anything Sunday morning. Sunday night, we were there again, all of us, the whole family. Brother Wood came in from the study. He said, Doc, come sit on the platform with us. Let me drop a little thought to you. I never, God tells me something. I let God work it out. I don't go run and tell people to the pastor, God told me to preach tonight. God sent me here with the message. 999 times out of 1,000, those people are wrong. Do you hear me? You let God do it. I didn't tell Brother Wood I've got anything. I didn't tell a living soul. I said, no, Doc, I just sat back here with my wife. Well, he went on the platform. And song leader started singing. He came back, Doc, come on up here and sit with us. I would ask you to preach, but I realize what you've been through the last few days and so on. But come and sit up here with us. I said, I'll just sit back here by my wife. I don't get to sit with her much. Third time, he came down and he said, Doc, I don't know what it is, but God wants you to say something or do something. Come on up here. I said, all right, if you think so. Still didn't tell him I did that. She let God work it out. Are you listening? Amen. I said, all right. So I went up and sat up there. I never did tell him I had anything. Well, he went on with the singing, took up the offering. He's up talking. He said, uh, Brother Hagin was here, would ask him to preach and so on, but I don't know what it is and said, you know him because that's my home church. They knew me pretty well. Said he won't tell anything or say anything, but I know in my spirit, God wants him to say something or do something. And whatever it is, I'm just going to turn it over to him and let him say whatever he wants to do, what he wants to. And I told a part of this experience. She had said to him, and I said, Joy, come on up here. And her husband brought her down there. Just in another world. 30 shock treatments, and they haven't helped her. I'd seen in the vision myself just lay my hand on her. I knew I was ministering to her. When I laid my hand on her and prayed, I heard myself call out three spirits. 
and they left her instantly and her face straightened up instantly. The crowd looked at her and they were shocked because her face is no longer the face of a person that's like a zombie. Her face is bright and shining and smiling. The devils are gone. Hallelujah to Jesus. And she told me something to tell the other folks, some of the children and so on. And I'll know when they make their dedication. I'll know when they make their consecration. We know about spiritual things up here. Well, I didn't mean to get into so much of that, but I wanted to establish the fact that your spirit's a real you. Amen. Say it out loud. My spirit, My spirit is the real me. Is the real me. Say it again. My spirit is the real me. Say it again. My one more time. My spirit is the real me. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Now, you remember what Jesus said? We're talking about spiritual development now. You know, it's just fun. Praise God to come out and follow the Spirit of God and see which way He's going to lead you. I mean, I'm, I'm not bound by my notes. I've got some notes. But when the Spirit starts leading me, I just go with Him. Amen. Amen. And read it. What I've said is still in context of what I'm talking about. I'm talking about spiritual things. I'm talking about the development of the human spirit. These things have to do with the spirit. Now, look at John the 16th chapter, the 13th verse. Jesus talked about the Holy Ghost. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come? When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. One translation said he'll guide you into all reality. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. That's spiritual development, isn't it? You see, he, the Holy Spirit, is to take the things of Jesus and the Father God and unveil them to us. Now let me say this in conclusion. Something that I've learned, I didn't always believe it. And when I first began to see it in the spirit, I, I couldn't hardly accept it. And yet it's true, absolutely true. I saw this years ago in some areas and then, and then I began to see it more over in the area of, of divine healing also. That in dealing with the sick, deal with their spirits. I saw this concerned about baptism in the Holy Ghost in 1949. See, I received the Holy Ghost by faith. Nobody was praying. Well, there's some couple fellas praying. I don't know what they said. And I knew you didn't have to go through all that tearing process that people went through, but I didn't say anything about it. And after I got over Pentecostals for two years, I never prayed with anybody. If they wanted to, okay. And then I saw this, that what we were doing, what they were doing in dealing with people who get filled with the Spirit was dealing with them mentally and dealing with them physically trying to get some action from their mind or some action from their body. Sometimes people say, holler louder so God will hear you. <laughs> well, that's not action from your spirit, that's action from your body. I mean, if God heard you because you hollered louder, well, why not get the microphone down there and turn off the, the PA system as loud as you could and holler as loud as you could. <laughs> I saw people tell people, get your hands higher so God will hear you. See a physical action. Well, if people, God hurt them because they got their hands higher, why not get a ladder and get them out on top of the house? They'd be real high that way. <laughs> Amen. And all kinds of things they'd tell people. Some of you folks nowadays don't know all that, but unless you get in some quarters and see it, but I began to deal with people's spirits. God is the father of spirits. Try to get as little physical action, as little mental action as possible. Deal with their spirits. I didn't tell them what it's doing. If I did, they wouldn't have accepted it. And then I started getting people filled with the Holy Ghost. They're just talking in tongues by the droves. I wouldn't go to a church and leave, but what everybody didn't have the Holy Ghost. And they had all those chronic seekers, you know, in Pentecost, they have been seeking for 30, 40, 50 years even. And I'd go away and leave them all of them talking in tongues because I learned how to get an action from their spirits. He is the Father, we read, the Father of spirits. Do you notice how many times in all these scriptures we read it talks about spirit, spirit, spirit? He's the father of spirits. Now in dealing with the sick, deal with their spirit. Now don't tell them so because they probably wouldn't accept it. 
but just do it without telling them. You see, friends, healing is spiritual. You see sometimes in the Crusades, and I'm going along laying hands on people in the healing line, and I'll say to them, that power went into you and came right back out of you. Now, why do I know? Well, first I, I felt it leave my hands and come back into my hands. It's healing power. Why did it come back out of them? I ministered it to them. Why did it come back out of them? Well, first, I know this. They didn't accept it. Don't you know that if I'd say, if I had that many, which I don't, I don't have any here, but we'll call them $1 bill, $100 bills there. Then there's some 20. We'll call all them hundreds. And I'd say, well, I don't have so many here, but here's about 10 bills altogether, uh, $1 and some 20s. And, and, and we'll just imagine that they're all hundreds. And I'd say, now, as long as these last, the first 10 gets up here because I've got $10, $100 bills here, first 10 people gets up here, I'm going to give you $100 each. Now, don't you think I could tell when you took hold of that $100 bill? Couldn't I? I said, couldn't I tell whether you received it or not? Yes. Spiritual things are just as real as material things are. Spiritual things are just as real as that dollar bill is. Spiritual things are just as real. If I said, here, take this microphone and lead us in a course, don't you think I could tell when he took hold of the microphone? Huh? If you handed somebody your Bible, they said, I didn't bring my Bible tonight. Here, take mine and use it. Couldn't you tell when they took hold of your Bible and received it? Sure you can. Spiritual things are just as real as material things are. And in the spirit, you see, it's your spirit that takes hold of God. It's your spirit that takes hold of healing because healing is spiritual because God's a spirit. And so I'll say to these people that that power goes into and comes back out of, now you tried to take hold of that with your mind. You can't receive, it's not mental. Healing is not mental. Because disease is not mental. Well, somebody said they got mental sickness. I said disease is not mental. Disease is not physical. It's manifested in the physical, but all disease, all sickness is spiritual. Are you listening to me now? Now, disease was laid on Jesus' spirit. It was not laid on his body. He was not sick, literally. It was laid on his spirit. The Bible said himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Now, where did he bear them? In his body? No, he'd have been sick if he had, literally. No, they were laid on his spirit. So I say to these people, keep your mind quiet and on Jesus. It's with the heart, that's your spirit, that man believes. Keep your mind quiet. Next time that comes, receive it. And the majority of the time then, not always, but the majority of time they will receive it. We're dealing with spirits. God is a spirit. Disease was laid on Jesus' spirit. His spirit was made cancerous with your cancer. His spirit was made sick with all the sicknesses of the world. He was made sin. He was made sick, the Bible tells us. The Word heals your spirit. He sent His Word and healed them, the 107th Psalm 20th verse said. That heals your mind and your body. The notice in the scripture we read about we're receiving this knowledge through the Word. We've never given the Word of God that's right place in our thinking. The Word is God speaking to us. Amen. The Word takes Jesus' place in our life today. 
The word living in us means that it functions in us, that it acts in us. We become doers of the word. Hallelujah to Jesus. God laid on him. Look there at Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, the fourth verse. Surely hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. You've studied enough, you know that the Hebrew said, surely hath borne our sickness and carried our pains. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. That's not the Roman soldiers nailing him to the cross. That's something God did. This is spirit, not flesh. We did esteem him stricken, stricken with our diseases, smitten with our diseases, afflicted with our diseases. Matthew said, Isaiah said himself, 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 took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. Did he take them upon his flesh? Did his flesh actually become cancerous? No, no. Yet himself took our infirmities. Himself bare our sicknesses. Did his flesh bear our sicknesses? Did his body bear our sicknesses? No, no. It was his spirit. It was his spirit. It was his spirit. It was his spirit. Sickness is spiritual. When we realize that, we'll approach it from a spiritual standpoint. You get people's spirits healed, their bodies will respond. Don't worry about that. Know that he took your infirmities and that he bare your sicknesses. Hallelujah. That his spirit bore that cancer that his spirit bore your diseases. Believe that in your spirit. Believe that in your heart. Hallelujah to Jesus. And I heard the spirit of God in my spirit say, now, now, you're coming close. Coming close to fresh revelation to new revelation from the word that's been there all the time. And when your spirit catches the revelation of what he did, your body will instantly respond. And you who are crippled will rise up and walk off right in front of everybody without anybody laying hands on you praying. And you who are cancerous, your cancer will fall away. And you who are sick, your sickness will dissipate and disappear. You shall rise up in health both spiritually and physically because the Lord is at work within you. For it is God who is at work both in you, both to do, within you, both to will and to do of his own good pleasure. And it is his pleasure that you walk in health. And it is in your, his pleasure that you walk in spiritual maturity. Yeah, that your spirit feed upon the word of God. That your spirit feed upon the word of God until you grow up into the knowledge of the Son of God and the knowledge of the revelation of the truth that belongs unto you. And so you'll run and not be weary and you'll walk and not faint, yea, either spiritually or physically, for the Lord is the strength of your life and your portion together uh, forever. Yea, his strength is your strength. His health is your health. His power is your power. His word is your word. Rise up and praise him for the Lord is at work among his own. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to Jesus. That concludes this message. For more information about Kenneth Hagin Ministries, call 1-888-283-2484 or visit our website at www.rhema.org or write Kenneth Hagin Ministries, Post Office Box 50126, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74150-0126. And in Canada, write Kenneth Hagin Ministries, Post Office Box 335, Station D, Etobicoke, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, M9A4X3.